With cryptocurrencies hitting new all-time highs and the euphoria spreading through the internet like wildfire, I thought to myself, what better time to talk about one of the most fascinating hacks in cryptocurrencies often hacked history. This is how an unknown entity broke into a Japanese exchange, stole more than $500 million, made their own cryptocurrency exchange, and are still roaming free to this very day. And I'm going to show you how they did it every step of the way and where the money is right now. 2012 Tokyo, Japan. Kuchira Wada and Yasuki Otsuka created the Bitcoin exchange called Regupress. This exchange was basic in service, but quickly grew in popularity due to being a relative early adopter in the growing Bitcoin world. With the service growing and the industry evolving, the creators decided to rebrand the service to the much more recognizable CoinCheck. By 2018, CoinCheck was responsible for billions of dollars in user funds that were deposited in their exchange. They got a haircut though, on 2.57 a.m. local time, Friday the 26th of January 2018. Hackers gained access to one of CoinCheck's hot wallets that contained $523 million of a cryptocurrency called Nemcoin, also called XCM. The Japanese exchange never publicized exactly what had happened, but what we do know is that one of the company terminals was somehow infected with malware. This gave the hackers an initial access to the wallet in question. On-chain analysis made it possible to see where CoinCheck had failed in their operational security. The entire balance of $523 million of Nemcoin was held in what is referred to as hot wallets. They are hot because they're connected to the internet, meaning you can move funds quickly and easily, as opposed to a cold wallet, which would be stored on an unnetworked device which pose a different but more physical security challenge. There are very few, if any, valid reasons to have half a billion dollars in a single cryptocurrency just sitting in a hot wallet. But luckily for the hackers, this is what they were greeted with. So as the hack was occurring, CoinCheck noticed that things had gone terribly wrong and put out a warning informing users, do not deposit any more NEM. Social media was quick on the uptick here. People were speculating that something had happened to the exchange, as large sums of money had started to move very quickly, and people watched for this. Within the next few days, CoinCheck put out a press release confirming the hack had occurred, which sent NEM's price tumbling as a result. At this time, outlets around the globe reported on the situation, calling it the largest hack in history, which was, at least in 2018, accurate. This also came with much speculation about what was going to happen to the funds, and it was totally off, since nobody shared the imagination of the CoinCheck hacker masterminds. So let's run through the timeline of exactly how it happened. By the time CoinCheck had announced the situation to the world, the funds had already been distributed to multiple different wallets. For a technical breakdown of exactly what happened, you'll see on screen that the initial NEM wallet of CoinCheck ending in 770G quickly distributed tokens in the amounts of 92 million, 100 million three times, 50 million twice, 30 million, and 750,000 to a total of eight wallets. In addition to this, some other smaller transactions occurred after the initial flurry for a total of around 18 different addresses. At this stage, the NEM developers were working closely with CoinCheck and the Japanese police to try and get out ahead of what they knew was coming next, money laundering. After all, what good is $500 million of hacked cryptocurrency that even an idiot like me can track in real time from point A to point B? That money will never be spendable unless the hackers are allowed to mix it up with other people's clean money, obscuring the link between the hack and where it eventually gets turned to real world cold hard cash. To begin with, the NEM Foundation plays mosaics in the tokens, an on-chain way to alert people, specifically centralized cryptocurrency exchanges, that this is hacked money, in the hopes they would freeze the money if it entered and allow for an eventual recovery. They were trying to slow down how the money could move and any off-ramps to get it into places that would make it harder to track later on. But the hackers were one step ahead of the game on this one. They initially filtered out the NEM between dozens of accounts, sending from the initial dozen or so wallets to more, as well as sending small amounts of the stolen cryptocurrency to seemingly random addresses. This obviously didn't work too well, because we can see them doing it clear as day, and $500 million is a lot to hide. 
So that's where they had another idea and did something I've never seen before that no one could have predicted. The hackers made a bet using an understanding of the human condition. They exploited one of the most powerful elements of the cryptocurrency market, greed. On February 7th, just a week or so after the hack occurred, in a fascinatingly easy to follow and yet unexpected move, the hackers sent out an on-chain message to several other addresses which contained an announcement. It opened with a link to a dark web address and said simply, XEM 15% off. This website link was a cryptocurrency exchange that the hackers themselves had created with one simple purpose, to offer people stolen funds in exchange for clean funds. To break it down, you send us Bitcoin and we'll send you NEM. We take a 15% standard money laundering haircut and then what you do with the stolen money is completely up to you. At first, only a few accounts were biting the juicy bait on the line. But as soon as people discovered they were not being hauled up into the open arms of the police with this interesting offer, but instead the open arms of an infinite money glitch, they started to attack that bait like a school of piranha. They essentially had an underground money laundering machine doing their work for them, all based on human greed. But as with anything on the blockchain, this leaves a trace. After all, money is going from one address to another, which made every person interacting with this offer a criminal, but more on that later. For now, the money laundering operation was a slow start, but a fast success. According to the timeline and research on this situation provided by Yoichi Tashaya and Naoki Hiramoto with their Science Direct case report, it took only 43 days for the hackers to sell out the NEM tokens. But what's interesting is what happened next. As you can see, Thousands of Bitcoin moving from the hundreds of wallets used for the exchange sales all consolidated to about 10 wallets. But the main two are right in front of you here, labeled as RCDTN and F4WKE. The largest wallet of these consolidated funds was the RCDTN, which had a total of 5,511 Bitcoins filtered through it with F4WKE having 2,949 instead. Tracking these wallets on chain, you can see that much like Shakira's hips, the blockchain does not lie. We see the money coming in, we see the money going out, and it was a lot of money, even for 2018 standards. What you see on screen is money moving into a wallet we've highlighted with a green line, and out of the highlighted wallet with a red line. The bolder the line, the more money involved in the transaction. So this is where things could get very confusing and complicated, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll break down the easy links and discoveries I made during my research for this video. First though, I want to explain something to you that made this story fascinating to me and occupied a lot of my time thinking about it. In my time on YouTube, I've covered a lot of cryptocurrency hacks, frauds, heists, and otherwise illegal operations. They almost always result in the perpetrator being captured and when reading through the case files of the US federal agents who brought them to justice, we see exactly how easy it is for them to find. After all, the blockchain shows us where the money is going, and it can never be spent as real money unless offloaded to real cash. Which means that if we see the money on chain, which we do, as I'm going to show you, we know that it eventually needs to break the link that makes it traceable. For that, you need something like a tumbler, which takes in cryptocurrency from many sources and then spits out cryptocurrency on the other side to fresh wallets. So the only link is essentially a black hole. If you leave it in there long enough and take out small portions at a time, there's no way to know whether it's from this hack or that hack or this person or another person. If this doesn't happen, we will always know exactly where it is or where it goes. This hack doesn't have any break in the link. We see exactly where it goes at all times. And where it goes is to the only place you can cash out cryptocurrency for real cash. Centralized exchanges such as Coinbase, Bybit, Binance and others. This is the point where usually I'd be reading from a case file of how the FBI had sent a subpoena to these exchanges who have logs of IP addresses for accounts accessing their services. They'd have KYC details including names and bank accounts and addresses. Pictures of ID. If there was tens of millions, hundreds of bitcoins, thousands of bitcoins going into these exchanges, they should know who has them. But that's the confusing part. 
because I've tracked much of the Bitcoin. There's a link to dozens of exchanges as clear as day to follow. And yet this story has not been in the headlines since 2018 when the hack occurred. No one has been arrested. No one is even talking about this hack anymore. It's like $500 million vanished and nobody remembers, knows or cares. While researching this video, I was shocked to find that no one remembers the details or, as far as I can tell, has been investigating where the money eventually ended up. So here are my findings. They're not complete as I felt the futility of continuing for a simple YouTube video, but you'll see most of the stolen and laundered Bitcoin in these examples. The lesser funded F4WKE sent Bitcoin to 11 total wallets, six that were never interacted with by the other wallet and five that were. The main wallet on the other hand sent funds to six shared wallets and two independents. After this, it gets tricky because essentially what you're doing is tracking transactions between wallets that often branch into multiple paths with multiple inflows and outflows of currency until the point that you're looking at a web of thousands of wallets interacting with each other. Without a visualizer or complex tools, tracking this would be incredibly labor intensive. Even with it, it can be difficult. So some of the transactions to centralized exchanges are as follows. June 13th, 15th, 22nd and 27th, as well as July 4th of 2019, 312 Bitcoin was deposited in five transactions to a Polynex account valued at the time $2.5 million total. June 7th, 8th, 13th and 27th, 290 Bitcoin across four transactions entered Kraken exchange for $1.6 million total. December 27th, 2018, 744 Bitcoin entered Bitfinex in a singular transaction valued at $2.8 million. These are just small examples. There were other larger wallets that seemed to be linked to other activity, which show thousands of Bitcoin passing through them ingoing and outgoing to exchanges as well. Often when you're following one of the links, you find small sums of Bitcoin that's been periodically moved, but now resting in accounts, waiting for something, who knows what. One such example is this wallet that currently has 326 Bitcoin sitting in there, which was moved one month ago, February 16th, 2024. Just to show how active these wallets still are, a day prior to that it was moved before, and then before that on December 6th, 2023, before that June 17th, 2022. So as you can see, it's years moving this Bitcoin over and over again, waiting for something. I wish I could answer why are the funds still moving around? I mean, who knows? But their investment has obviously paid off big time, as this amount back when they initially moved all the funds would have been around $2 million in 2019. But today, that 326 Bitcoin is worth approximately $22.5 million. And I've just teased you with the small amounts, because look at this one. December 6th, 2023, three months ago, this wallet was transferred 3,000 Bitcoin, which today is worth about $204 million. This money had previously been dormant in another wallet since August of 2021. One of the largest exchanges going into an exchange you can find is February 22nd, 2019, when 4,004 Bitcoin went to Bitfinex, worth at the time $16 million. I could keep going, but hopefully you get the point. Trust me, there's a lot more where this came from, including some things I just couldn't show or explain without turning this video into something else entirely. Suffice to say, this story is unique and it isn't over yet. I've covered many different cryptocurrency hacks in my time, and this one stood out as being interesting in the way they tried to hide the initially hacked funds. That part of the process worked incredibly well, but there's something that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Usually hacked Bitcoin doesn't end up in exchanges because if law enforcement is looking, they have the perfect paper trail to follow the money. That's why things like crypto tumblers such as Tornado Cash exist, to further launder money to the point they're in fresh wallets with no connection to the initial funds, breaking that on-chain link. Now, let me give you the stats to put into perspective how massive this hack was. When you value Bitcoin in today's numbers, and why it's weird that nobody remembers this happened. The amount of money that went through multiple wallets ended up being in the ballpark of around 14,000 Bitcoin. 
which let's remember they took a 15% haircut on the initial 500 mil hack money as well as that cryptocurrency going down, otherwise this number would have been much higher. But 14,000 Bitcoin as I write this video is around $980 million. The initial amount stolen was already one of the biggest hacks in history, but if this money was just sitting around today, it would make it one of the largest stolen funds in existence. But let's remember much of these 14,000 Bitcoins were deposited to various centralized exchanges from 2018 onwards. Though, as I've shown, some large wallets are still visibly holding and moving Bitcoin in the hundreds of millions of dollars between wallets, almost as we speak. But more on this in a minute, as with most aspects of this story, there's a twist coming. Now let's look at those unlucky few. As I mentioned earlier, some people were held responsible for this hack, or at least a part of it. The greedy few who helped to initially money launder the NEM when it was stolen into clean Bitcoin. Well, 30 of those were arrested by the Japanese police in 2021 in association with their purchase of those stolen goods. These 30 men were found to have traded around $100 million worth of the cryptocurrency initially taken from the CoinCheck exchange. Of those 30, two of them were prolific in accounting for most of the trading. As a result of the Japanese police's investigation and arrests in this matter, they concluded that around 400 or so million dollars of the funds were laundered by overseas entities and thus out of reach of the Japanese authorities. Meaning that of the 500 and something million dollar initial hack value, these arrests only accounted for less than one fifth of the amount laundered, leaving over 400 million dollars of laundered NEM to have been profited from majorly from those greedy few without any punishment for over seven years and counting. So with 30 Japanese citizens who briefly profited from the hack being small cogs in a greater machine that remains in operation, the hackers remain thoroughly free and as shown by the recent Bitcoin wallet activity, still actively moving the ill-gotten gains. But how is this even happening? Having seen how in-depth and easily the United States federal government finds large-scale hackers like this, it's very hard for me to believe that the hackers will never be caught, especially since the on-chain transactions are there to the very second, with multiple exchanges being involved. For me, looking from the outside, cryptocurrency exchanges act somewhat like a black hole or a money tumbler themselves, meaning that when we see the money enter an exchange, it's very likely the link is broken and we can no longer publicly see the transactions. So when I said that the value of the Bitcoin, if it was intact today, would be $900 million, it doesn't really matter if we saw large portions of it entering exchanges and assuming it was sold out at the time. But what if it wasn't? What about if this time, we could see where all the money went. What about if all the Bitcoin was still there, just entering exchanges on one end, being filtered through dozens of accounts, wallets, exchanges, and being sent to sit inactive somewhere else? What if much of it was sitting on exchanges right now, the majority still there, waiting to be looked at by anyone with the authority to do so, with the potential to recover the stolen funds all these years later and catch the people responsible for this forgotten hack? or maybe waiting there for people to forget, for the perfect moment to cash out on close to a billion dollars of stolen and laundered Bitcoin, making it one of the most perfect heists and crimes in history. This could all be happening right now, because it looks like people did forget. Until now. What happens from here, I can't say. But at least you'll also remember, and maybe somebody out there will watch where the Bitcoin goes next. Thanks for watching.